start with this double integral uh, over the region R. Is the R given? Uh, it doesn't say a given R. Hold on a second. Let me let me let me Don't... see. Can you show us the question itself? Uh, one second. Let me pull it up. loading one second hmm. how do i uh share my screen oh just you have to stop sharing the previous one uh, oh. i have actually i have here oh you have it okay uh, where it says suggest a substitution or transformation that will simplify the following integrand and find that Jacobian's SE. Okay, all right. You're not given R, so you cannot uh, evaluate, calculate this double integral. All right. So yeah. next, okay. Ron, oh, all done, or do you want me to put it back up? No, you're done. You're okay, done. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ryan, 6.115. Then this, 6.217, water, 6.211, Brianna, 6.14. Ryan, are you ready? You can go ahead. Uh, so my question uh, basically asked me to solve four different questions, sort of. So uh, I, I chose uh, question 15, and it basically, um, oh, I think I need a little bit more context. So the, the question basically gave us, uh, it said um, uh, T of X uh, equals um, A uh, times X. Uh, as a transformation and a is a, a linear map which is a two by two matrix it didn't give anything else um and it basically asked it, it basically used that as context for uh like questions 12 to 17 so all of these are encompassed by that so it basically asks um it basically gives the definition or somewhat of a definition for an affine map, um, which is that the transformation uh, gives gives the transformed function plus a constant uh, v vector. Um, and then it asks us to show that uh, exercises 12, 13, and 14 hold for, uh, for basically uh, an affine transformation. So for 12, it asks to show that T is one to one if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. So basically, we start out with uh, T of X equals AX. So to prove that it's one to one, we can just uh, set AX equal to AY where x and y are unique points because the uh basically in order for it to be one to one uh every point has to transform onto an, a unique point so um in order to solve for x and y we have to divide but we can't divide a matrix on both sides we have to invert it so in order for it to be invertible its determinant cannot be zero uh so we basically get uh, A times the inverse of A on both sides, and that becomes X equals Y. And then to prove that it's affine, we just add that constant vector to both sides, and we still prove that X equals Y, which means it's affine. For 13, it again asks us to show that the determinant is not equal to zero. Uh, if and only if t is onto. So uh, for it to be onto, all of its co-domain must be images of its original domain. 
So I basically set AX equal to Y, uh, not the same Y as uh, before exactly, but basically just to show that um, that the original function um, maps onto the codomain and all points of the codomain. Uh, so that basically ends up being uh, X equals the, uh, the inverted matrix A times Y. Um, and of course, to invert it, a uh, the determinant of a must not be zero. Um, then for it to be affine, uh, a x plus v equals y. Again, we we get uh, a x equals y minus v, uh, and that exists for all y just as this does. So basically, it's still onto. And it's still affine because it's y minus a constant v vector, which you could offset just by changing the y. And the last one, which is uh, 14, asks us to uh, basically show that uh, if the determinant is not 0, again, uh, t takes parallelograms and maps them onto parallelograms. And it basically gives us this function right here to uh, to give a general parallelogram in R2, uh, where uh, lambda and mu are between 0 and 1. And uh, v is not a scalar multiple of w. So I use that assumption later on. So basically, uh, we have... Uh, Q equals P plus lambda V plus uh, mu W. And I apply the transformation to both sides. And because it's a linear map, we can take that transformation and we can split it uh, to each part of the function because linear maps preserve addition, scalar multiplication. And so we basically split it up to uh, T of P uh, lambda, since it's a scalar, uh, t of v plus mu t of w. And because we assume that they are not scalar multiples of each other, uh, and it has the same form as the original, which is q equals p plus lambda v plus mu w, we can assume that it takes one par parallelogram and maps it onto another parallelogram. And uh, here, to prove that it's affine, I basically just added the uh, constant vector, and I changed it to z, because we already have z uh, right here. And um, as you can see, it's still basically the same function, but with that constant v, uh, I'm sorry, with that constant z, uh, which basically means that it's still the same, but just shifted, which makes it affine. Nice. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Let's, thank you. Let's six point two seventeen. Then Walter, Brianna, Ivy. So I'm going to do number 17 from the section 6.2. Um, it's asked to find the area bounded by the limit scale x squared plus y squared um, square equals to 2a square parenthesis x squared minus y squared using um, polar coordinate. So I started by doing a um, sort of sketch of the region of the limited scale um, that will be represented by the equation that they give. And before we can find um, the area, we're going to have to change the coordinate. 
into polar coordinate. So we know that x equals to r cos theta and y equals to r sine theta. So those new value for x and y, we replace them into the equation of Lemonade's kit they give us. So x squared become um, r squared cos squared theta, y squared um, r squared sin squared um, theta, and we do the same in the, the other side. And we factor by, since it, r squared is common, we factor by r squared. So we have r squared factor um, cos squared theta plus sine square da da everything square equals to two a square parentheses or square cos square da da minus sine square da da so we see that we have some identity there we know that cos square da da plus sin square da da equals to one and cos square da da minus sin square da da is cos two da da so we replace this into our equation we end up with or um, exponent 4 equals to 2a square or square cos 2 theta. Since we have um, r square on both sides, so we kind of like simplify by r square. So we have now um, r square equals to 2a square cos 2 theta. To find the value of r, we take the square root on both sides. So r equals to square root of 2a square cos 2 theta. Um, we realize that r square is greater or equals um, to zero, and the angle takes the value of negative. It's between negative pi over four and pi over four. We also have three pi between three pi over four and five pi over four. So the angle exists in two region, and so to do the integ um the integrand, we have to use a double integration so the region d is um that is from between negative pi over four pi over four and also between z and or is between zero and square root of two a square because two that up so we're gonna go ahead uh, and create and set up uh, our double integral to find the area so we have um two um double integral based on the region of d f of or data it's um d or d data we know that the jacobian is equals to r so we go ahead and we replace that we're gonna start by integrate first or first um from zero to square root of two a s square cos two data so when we integrate or give us a square over two and we do this going from zero to square root over two a square cos two data that's give us um square root of a square cos two data uh square over two we simplify and then now we integrate um going from negative pi over four to pi over four that's um give us um sine 2 times pi over 4 over 2 minus times 2 times negative um, pi over 4 over 2. And we um, add them and simplify. That gives us 2a squared. So the area bounded by the equation of the limited kit, x squared plus y squared everything squared equals to 2a squared times x squared minus y squared is 2a squared. Nice. All right. Walter, then Brianna, Ivy. Um, okay, so for... Um... Question 11 of section 6.1, we're asked to elaborate this double integral um, x squared plus y squared uh, with an exponent of 3 over 2 dx dy, where d is a disk um, x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 4. 
And so what I first noticed is that we don't have endpoints for X and Y. And so um, we would actually have to convert our X and Y co uh, coordinates into polar coordinates. And so the relationship between those two is that X can be defined as R uh, cosine theta, while Y can be defined as R sine theta. And that's important because what I did next was to, I substituted those two values, X and Y, into our disk, which, um, so we would get uh, R cosine squared plus R sine um, squared, which um, if you simplify, you would get uh, R squared um, parentheses sine theta plus uh, cosine squared theta. And inside of parentheses, that's just a trig identity that would just be equal to one. So you'll be left with R squared. And that's important because now we can actually find our uh, endpoints for R. Since uh, we're trying to look for R's highest boundary, we can use the disk. And since we know that um, X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared, and, and the highest uh, boundary for X squared plus Y squared is four, we can set uh, R squared equal to four. We can find the square root of um, R squared to cancel out the two, which would give us R equal to two. And so our boundary for R would be between zero and two, while theta would be between zero and two pi. Then I looked for, uh, um, I forgot what's it called, Jacobian's, I believe. Jacobi. Yeah, Jacobian's determinant, um, where we use uh, x, the x and y values and find them in terms of r and theta. So the first row would take uh, the x um, value, r uh, cosine theta, and find them in, um, first find them in r in terms of r and then find them in terms of theta. The second row would just take the y value and find them in terms of r in terms of theta. And we would just get this two by two matrix and we will find the determinant of that two by two matrix, which would be uh, our uh, parentheses cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And again, our parentheses would inside would just be equal to one. We multiply that by R and we get our determinants to be equal to R. Um, so now, um, since we have our determinant as well as our boundary points for R and, and theta, we can actually convert our initial double integral into um, an integral that has endpoints, um, but it will be this time, instead of being in terms of X and Y, it will be in terms of R and theta. And so we could actually substitute uh, X squared plus Y squared with um, R squared, since in the beginning we defined that X, uh, X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. So, you will, so we will substitute that in there. So we will have R squared with an exponent of three over two, which 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 would be equal to our uh, cube, so R to the three uh, to the third power, and our determinant was R. So we would just multiply R cubed by R, which would give us R to the fourth, and our boundary points would be actually so with our boundary points, our double integral would look like. Um, the integral from zero to two pi brackets are um, the integral from zero to two of r to the fourth dr close brackets d theta. And then from here, we'll basically just find the double integral just as if it was x and y. And so our inner integral, um, the integral of r to the fourth would be r to the fifth over pi evaluated from zero to two. And so then um, you, I got an answer of 32 over 5. Um, then we'll solve our outer integral. So we know that 32 over 5 would actually be a constant in terms of theta. And so we can actually remove the constant outside the integral. And so the integral of the, uh, of the theta would just be theta. And we would eva uh, evaluate theta um, with 0 and 2 pi, which would just give me 2 pi. And we will multiply 2 pi by our constant 32 over 5, and you get a final answer of 64 pi over 5. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Bri Brianna, then Ivy, then Mahama Babu, then Gabriel, Gregory, Yuri, then Mahama Zeman, Josephine, Jun Yi. Uh, so this is 6.1 question four, and it asks to find the linear map T such that T of D star equals D. So I started by just sketching out the region, the rectangle of D star, which is a square. 
and I'm trying to find the transformation that will give the image, that's D. So using theorem one, I start by looking at the points for D star and I see that uh, the transformation keeps the origin uh, zero, zero. So um, then since T of X, since the transformation of X is equal to A of X, I use um, matrix multiplication to plug in the matrices to find A, B, C, D. And then after I have matrix A, I again, use the two by two matrix to multiply by X and Y. And that gives me the transformation to get the image ready. So like, um, so like the points corresponding for the transformation of one zero equals uh, negative one three, one one equals negative two zero, and zero one will equal uh, negative one, negative three. And I only did the um, matrix multiplication for the one zero to negative one three and one one to negative two zero because that gave me what I needed to find A, B, and C, D. Okay, so in the end, your transformation is? Oh, oh. A negative x minus y is for the x, and then 3x minus 3y. Right, okay. All right, very nice. Okay. All right, that's uh, Brianna. Next one, Ivy. So I chose to do 6.3.3, and for this unit, we have to use integrals to um, find applications. And for my question, it's asking to find the average of xy when y is sine xy over d at 0 pi times 0 pi. So to find the average, we have to use the equation, the double integral of x, um, xy dx dy over dx dy. So first, I, um, I calculated the top, so, that's good. so then we do from zero to pi y sine xy dx, which is negative cosine xy over y. We're gonna evaluate that over zero to, um, pi to zero, or I mean zero to pi. We get uh, negative cosine pi y plus one dy. We integrate that, evaluate that, um, and we get pi minus sine pi squared over pi. Uh, we're done with the numerator, so now we have to calculate the denominator. And for the denominator, we get uh, pi squared at the end when we find both integrals. So after that, we just plug it, um, plug the numerator and denominator into the equation. We get pi minus sine pi squared over pi over pi squared. Uh, I'm going to, uh, um, does it, what's the word again? I simplify it. And you get 1 over pi minus sine pi squared over pi 3. And if you want in it to just put everything under pi um, pi 3, I just make um, 1 pi squared. All right. Yeah. You're ahead of us. This is my application of one of the applications. All right. So next one. Mahama Babu, then Gabriel, then Gregory. Okay, so the person that was supposed to present said just said that um his mic isn't working, so I'm just gonna go so we can save time. 
Um, okay. But it's real. Um, so I am doing 6.2, number 15. And um, it's basically just asking us to integrate this function over the cylinder. So obviously, like the textbook says, we just have to convert all of like our X and Y's into, well, not convert, but like we just use the cylindrical coordinates. Um, so the first thing is we're given the boundaries for Z, but then we have to find the boundaries for um, rho and for theta. So I use the x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four equation first. And I um, referred to the rho um, equation where rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Um, so then I got rho is equal to two based on the equation. And so that's how I got my boundary for rho. It's zero is less than or equal to rho and less than or equal, and rho is less than or equal to two. And then we just know from basic knowledge that um, theta has to be within zero and two pi. So then I just wrote that down. Um, so then I put it all together. I took the original function and then I put it into um, an integral and I put it in the order where the innermost is rho and then followed by z and then theta. So then I just took all the boundaries that are in purple, green, and orange, and I put them in the integrals. And to make it easier, since um, you can separate them, I separated them, and then I, I integrated them individually because they weren't, like, like, interconnected. So for the green one, which is rho, I made t equal to rho squared. So then... I derived that and I got two rho d rho and then I used that for when I was integrating. So then I integrated the orange part and then I got two pi obviously because we would just get theta and then you have to um, sub or like evaluate or substitute it. So that's why I got two pi and then I did the purple one. And so the um, integration of z is just z squared over 2 and then bounded by 2 and 3 so I just wrote that, that down and then I substituted um, my t variable into my integral and then I integrated that and then um, I just sim simplified it further but then you have to keep in mind that we substituted t so I put back um, rho squared and from what we solved earlier like the first step rho is equal um so yeah so then i just put in my boundaries zero and two and that's how i got five pi over two times e to the four minus one nice okay so we come back to back to mahama babu can you hear me yeah awesome 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 give me one moment i'm going to share my screen Uh, share application, share screen. Um, uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So for question 12, um, I'm kind of questioning because this is more of a linear algebra question, it seems like, more than a multivariable. But for question 12, it says show that um, t is one to one if and only if uh, a is not zero. So the way um, I approached this was like, I set A equals one, two, three, four, and the determinant of A will not be zero. So I got the determinant of A, which will be um, negative two. And then I wanted to get the inverse of uh, A as well. And then once I do that, once I get the inverse, um, <clears throat> one moment, uh, I get a linear independent function and a linear independent matrix. So what happens is if I have a linear independent matrix, this implies, I think, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, that um, it's a one-to-one -one function. I mean, it's one-to-one. -one. If it's linearly independent, it's one-to-one. -one. Um, and I also tested with these two, like T of zero, I get this zero, and T of one, which A times one. And that's like, I guess one, I get only one, two, three, four. If that makes sense, I mean, I, I just tested. I tested a lot of this out. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. 
Okay, that's, um, so Gregory next, Yuri, let me, uh, Muhammad Zeman, Josephine, Jun Yi. Wait, if you're talking, I cannot hear you. Uh, good morning, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah, good morning. Good evening. Yes, thank you. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'll be presenting section 6.1, question 3. And so our question here is, let D be a square with vertices um, 0, 0, 1, comma, 1, 2, 0, and uh, 1, negative 1. And D star be a parallelogram with vertices 0, 0, 1, 2, 2, 1, and um, 1, negative 1. And so I drew here our um, images. And here's also the same thing on GeoGebra with the sketch. And so the original um, figure that we have here is the parallelogram um, that we want to map onto this square here in, that I labeled D in red. And something we should know is that our vertices will map to vertices and a parallelogram will be mapped to a parallelogram. So we can just pay attention to the vertices here since we already know that we're going to end up with a parallelogram. And we can see that the points that get stretched would be B and C, which would map to like B prime and C prime, right? And so we should know that for our transformation T, it will map from R2 to R2, as we can see here in this picture. And we should know that um, our transformation applied to a vector X would be the same thing as a matrix A applied to the same vector X. And we can see that A should be a two by two matrix with components A, B, C, D. And we want to map D star to D, which was the rectangle to the square. And so this is what it would look like if we were to expand this equation here. And so here's our transformation that we're going to apply to the vector or the points that we have. And A would be a matrix of up here applied to the same vector. And they should be equal to the same thing. So the transformation T must have the following properties. The determinant must not be equal to zero and T of X must equal to A of X. And so if we expand like this, A of X would look something like this and X would be each point that we have been given within um, D star. And so taking A X of D star um, with all the coordinates would be listed here. And we go ahead and we can expand this out using matrix multiplication. And we know that our two by two matrix multiplied by a two by one matrix will result in a two by one matrix here. And we can do it um, by finding A times the first component here, times added to B times zero here. And we do the same thing for C times this component and then added to D times this component. And we do that for all of the coordinate points that were given. And then we end up with this little system of equations here, which equals to our coordinate points. And so let me zoom out really quickly. And we can solve this system of equations here to find out what each of these are, A, B, C, and D. And we can go ahead by and doing that by finding which one of these equations have the same variables with an answer. And so we go ahead and we can find B first, which would be equal to zero, right? By taking the third equation and multiplying it by negative two, add that to equation five, since it already has uh, two A, and we get this result here. Negative two A plus positive two A will cancel out and we can solve for B. B will be uh, zero. And then we can use that to find A 
within one of those equations. So now we have A is one, B is zero. And we can do the same approach for C. We can find that C is equal to a negative one third. And then we can use the remaining equation where C and D is present and we can substitute in for C. And we can find that D is equal to a positive two thirds. <clears throat> So here we can um, rewrite our variables a, b, c, and d with the um, the solutions that we just found from that system of equations up top, and we know that the determinant of a, which is this matrix here, must not be equal to zero. So we find the determinant is uh, two thirds, and so this is a valid linear transformation. And since we have points x equals to a uh, x comma y where x was that uh like this this vector here um we go back up we can see that all those would be in r2 and so our transformation is valid so t applied to x which would be x comma y should be the same thing as a times x and that's generalities for any kind of um matrix that we have right this is just a general formula and we can see that if we expand it out again, this is what we get. And so applying the matrix multiplication of A times X, where X would be X comma Y, we can find our X component is here. Our Y component results in this, right? If you do matrix multiplication on this. And we can do a little proof to check, um, you know, given the point in uh, D star. And does it map to D? And we can find that, yes, if we do the matrix multiplication, from here, and we pick a point in uh, D star, we can find that the corresponding point, like B prime, would map to B, uh, C, and C prime, they map to each other, and that proves that our linear transformation is correct and true. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Of course. You read next, then Muhammad Zaman, Josephine Jing Yi. Yes, Professor, I wanted to present question 6.1.8, but actually it's very, very similar to what just Greg presented. So would you mind if I present something uh, different? Nobody called this problem, so it shouldn't be the problem oh. for anyone else. No, I, it's okay. It's okay. I have another it's a problem. similar, yeah. different questions. Uh? Yeah, it's a different question, but the, the approach is absolutely the same so i have something different different to present actually so if you don't mind oh sure okay sure, of course mm -hmm. okay so uh then i want to show you to present question 6.2.5 it says that uh, linear map t of u v is equal to for u comma to u plus 3v this star is a rectangle uh, these the vertices 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, which is the pic in the picture over over here. But your screen, hold on, your screen, oh, um, this sorry. is 6, oh, 6. 2.5, I see. Okay, go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Right. All right. Uh, so basically we have the um, uh, rectangle, the square, uh, this star, and we need to find uh, kind of uh, an image of it uh, to, what, um, to what it transforms uh, and evaluate the, the given integrals. So it will be given two integrals, which we will have to evaluate. So uh, we want to use this kind of identity that uh, linear map of x uh, is equal to a times x, that where a is the transformation matrix, and we can extract transformation matrix from uh, this linear map T of UV. So in this case, uh, our U is equal to four and V is equal to zero for the first component. And for the second component, the uh, U is equal to two and V is equal to three. Now I have, we have the transformation matrix A. And uh, to be able to proceed, uh, we have to check if the determinant of this matrix is not equal to zero. 
and indeed it is equal to 12, which is not zero. And now we conclude that this transformation is valid and it takes vertices, it maps vertices into vertices and parallelograms into parallelograms. Uh, so we can move on now. So, and uh, then we have to find the paral parallelogram, which uh, this uh, map transforms R squared into. Uh, so how we do this, again, we use this formula. We know A, we know, um, uh, we know the points of, uh, of, the tr uh, of the square and we apply this formula to find the vertices of our new parallelogram. So T of uh, zero one is equal to matrix A times this point zero one. And then we get that this point A transforms into the point K in the picture, which is zero comma three. And then uh, point one comma one uh, transforms into uh, another vertex for five, which is point N in the picture. Then the point one point one comma two transforms into four comma eight, which is uh, I believe it should be K, uh, M. Yes, point M, and uh, the point of the original rectangle. 0, 0,2 transforms into the point uh, 0, 0,6. So basically what we, what we have here in the picture, we can see that our transformation takes a square, this small square, this, this star, and maps it into a parallelogram, KLMN, which is uh, like parallelogram D. Uh, so, and uh, then what we want to do after that is to find the Jacobian. So we can, after that, we can uh, evaluate the integrals. Uh, so the Jacobian of this transformation uh, is, uh, so this is our, sorry, one second. So to, to find the Jacobian, we find the partial derivatives, matrix of partial derivatives, with respect to u and v of uh, the original, the given functions for, in our case, x is equal to four u, it's from over here, uh, and y is equal to two u plus three v. Uh, so uh, I find the Jacobian and it is equal to 12 and the absolute value of 12 is also 12. Uh, I need the absolute value because uh, for our formula, when we uh, evaluate the integrals, uh, we find the integrals, uh, we need the absolute value of Jacobian, not just Jacobian. If it's negative, we should take the positive value. Uh, so, and there are two parts of this problem, uh, two integrals which we need to evaluate. And the first one is here. So this is integral over D uh, of xy dx dy. Uh, using the Jacobian and the information from the picture for the boundaries, we can rewrite this integral. So instead of x, we use for, for u. Instead of y, we use 2u plus 3v. We multiply them. And then we multiply by the absolute value of Jacobian. And we change the um, uh, variables from dx dy to du dv. And uh, in this integral, double integral, we have the, um, uh, the boundaries, the limits of integrations. Uh, as shown here, I want to know that uh, the innermost integral for, goes from 1 to 2, because I decided to evaluate it with respect to v first. And uh, then uh, the outermost integral goes from 0 to 1. So this is basically our rectangle, uh, the, uh, the star, uh, because I evaluate it with uh, respect to u. And actually, the integral is not very difficult to find. Uh, I don't think it's worth to just read it. So at the end, I get the answer 140. It's just simple calculus. Uh, so for the second integral, 
uh, we need to evaluate double integral over d of x minus y dx dy. So we can rewrite it again as the double integral uh, over d star, which is our original square. Uh, and again, uh, instead for, uh, for x, I substitute for u, and for y, I substitute 2y minus 3b to get the new function, then multiply by the absolute value of Jacobian and uh, limits of integrations I take from uh, d star, not from d, uh, which is, uh, and d star is our original square. And in this case, I also decided to change the, um, the order. Uh, I first evaluate integral with respect to v, uh, and then with respect to u. We can do it because the uh, boundaries are just numbers. And at the end, again, the integral is, itself is very, very basic. And at the end, the answer is negative 42. Very nice. All right, so Mr. Uh, Muhammad Zaman, then Josephine, then Jun Yi, then Josephine, then Jun Yi. Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Are you able to see the question? I think it's probably coming up. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, now. OK, 5.2, number 13. The question asks us to use a double integral to find the area inside the curve, which is given by r equals 1 plus sine theta. So the r represents the curve itself. We find out that the, it's a specific oh. time. Yeah. Your screen is gone. So do you see now? Uh, let, let's wait a little bit. Not yet. Yes, now. So we find out that it's a particular type of a curve. More specifically, it's a polar curve, which means that it uses a polar coordinate system. So we sketch it. We sketch r equals 1 plus sine theta this is a rough sketch and what we find out from the sketch is the range or the direction of the curve itself and we find out that it ranges from 0 to 2 pi overall so we use that for the double integral itself so that goes out that goes for the outer integral so 0 to 2 pi and for the inner integral, we already know that the curve itself is 1 plus sine theta. So we range it from 0 to 1 plus sine of theta. That's as for the inner integral. So that's how we set up the double integral using the knowledge we've, give, we've been given. So after that, R, which represents the curve itself, we just plug it in. We get the integral because it's the curve. So we integrate just the r itself. We plug in the r for d, d theta and we integrate r. We get r squared divided by 2. Then to move on to the first part of the double integral itself, we have to plug in the 1 plus sine theta. Then we have to subtract it from the 0, of course, d of theta. After that, when we simplify the equation or the expression, we get 1 plus 2 sine theta plus sine squared theta, d of theta, and we bring the half outside to make the expression less complicated. We find out that we have two signs, and something looks suspicious here. So the sine squared theta we find out that we can plug in a double angle identity to make the uh, expression look less complicated. So we already know from the double angle identities that sine squared theta equals one minus cosine of two theta divided by two. So when we plug that in, we get one plus two sine theta 
plus one minus cosine two theta divided by two d theta. The half is still outside. Now we have to move on. We even further simplify this expression itself. We get three divided by two plus two sine theta minus cosine of two theta divided by two. Now we finally integrate. So we have to plug in the zero and the two pi, meaning the outer integral, the inner integral is done already. So to do that, we have to first integrate this, uh, this expression. After integrating, we get three divided by two theta plus two times negative cosine of theta minus sine of two theta divided by four, two times uh, two is four, which is here as well. It simplifies the into- The screen yeah. is gone again. So your screen's gone again. Is my voice clear? No, your screen. Your screen is gone again. You see, just one minute. It should be loading back. You see now? Uh, not yet. I guess it's okay. It's okay. So you see right. it now? Uh, no, but it's okay. I have seen it. All right. Uh, so Josephine, then Jun E, then Tanya. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I did 6.2, um, question number three. It says, let D be the unit disk, X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to one. Evaluate the double integral of E to the X squared plus Y squared DX DY by making a change of variables to polar coordinates. So, um, oh, so X is equal to R cosine theta, Y is equal to R sine theta, and then X squared plus Y squared is equal to um, R squared, um, and then we know that R lies between zero and one um, because of our disk, and then theta lies between zero and two pi. So then um, our double integral becomes um, zero to two pi, zero to one of E to the R squared, since X squared plus R, Y squared is equal to R squared, um, R dr d theta, and then here we let um, R squared equal to U, and then 2R dr is equal to du, so 1 half du is equal to R dr. Um, and then here, like the bounds don't change because since it's just, um, since u is equal to R squared, one will stay one and zero will stay zero. So then we have um, the integral of zero to one e to the u times um, 1 half du. So you could take the 1 half in the front. So the inter when you integrate eu, it still stays eu. So then um, plugging in one minus, then plugging in zero, you get um, e minus e to the zero is one, so e minus one. But we still have to integrate with respect to theta. So you could take out e minus one because that's just a number. So I took that in front of the integral, and then you get um, just when you integrate one, it's just theta. So then plugging in two pi, then plugging in zero, you get um, one half times e minus one times two pi, and then the two cancels, so you're left with pi times e minus one. Okay, All right. So doing e and tanya. Can you see my screen, Professor? Yes. Yeah, and actually I'm presenting like 6.2, but like my, I typed it, I, I write it as like a 6.b, but actually it's a 6.2, question 10. Okay. So um, it asks to um, evaluate for this one. One sec. Okay, so the, uh, giving out like uh, the double integral of one over x plus y, 
with a x is 0, y is a 0, x plus y equal to 1, n equal to 4. Well, the transformation is c of u comma v equal to u minus u v comma u v. So I uh, convert it to x, like whether x equal to u minus y, then u is equal to x plus y. y equal to u times v, then the v equal to y over x plus y. So, and I do the um, intervals, I convert it into u and v also, like where the uh, y is 0, so the x is from 1 to 4, then the v is 0, is the, and the u is also from 1 to 4. Uh, x plus y equal to 1, so uh, the x is from 0 to 1, y is from 0 to 1, then u is also equal to 1, 1 from, oh, okay. <laughs> Can you see that, Professor? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, oh, we're we're up to. Okay. So the u is also equal to one. Then where the uh, the interval from uh, of the v is from zero to one. Then x plus y is equal to four. Then the x is from zero to four, and the y is also from zero to four. And I convert it into u. The u equal to four. The v is from 0 to 1. So if I, uh, by finding the UN interval of u and v, so I, I final, fi um, finally I got the u equal to 1, where the interval is from 0 uh, to 1. The v equal to 1, where the u is from 1 to 4. Then I do the double, uh, do the um, derivative of x comma y over the u comma v is equal to u, final answer. And then I do the double integral, so, so I plug in the u, so it's u over u, du, dv. And then the interval is from uh, the uh, 1 to 4 and then the 0 to 1, dv, du. So I got the final answer is 1 times 3, the e equals to 3. All right. Thank you. thank you. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, last one. Um, so I'm presenting 6.1 question 10. Um, it says, let D star be the parallelogram with vertices at negative 1, 3, 0, 0, 2, negative 1, and 1, 2. And D be the rectangle D equals 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. And find a T such that D is the image set of D star under T. Um, so I first um, wrote the linear um, mapping is t is equal to uv equals to xy. And then I um, did the, I just wrote on the side that d equals from 0 is less than or equal to x, as x is less than or equal to 1, and 0 is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to 1. And then I drew it, I drew the, um, the d star and the d. Um, and then that can show how, um, how which vertices are going to be mapping onto um, the other. Um, and I did it of the form x equals au plus bv and y equals cu plus dv. So I did um, t0, 0, 0 equals 0, 0. So then that's just going to be 0. And then um, t12 equals to 1, 1. So then the x is 1 equals to a plus 2b. And then also 1, x is 1, and then equals to uh, the y is 1 equals to c plus 2d. And then t negative 1, 3 equals to 0, 1. And then 0, the x equals to 0. So 0 is equal to negative a plus 3b. And 1 equals to negative c plus 3d. And then t to negative 1 equals to 1, 0. 1 equals to 2a minus b. And then 0 equals 2c minus d. So then I had to figure out what a, b, c, and d are. So I did a system of equations. And I did 0 equals negative a plus 3b. And, and with the other equation, 1 equals a plus 2b. I got b equals to 1 over 5. I plugged that in. And I got a equals 3 over 5. 
Um, then I did 1 equals c plus 2d with the other equation 1 equals negative c plus 3d, and I got d equals 2 over 5, and I plug that in to get what c is, and c equals 1 over 5. So all of us together, we got the matrix 3 over 5, um, 1 over 5, and then 1 over 5, 2 over 5. And then finding the determinant, it's 1 over 5, so it's not equal to 0, which is good. And then to um, then here, um, I did t um, xy is, is equal to t of v. t of v, in this case, I just did xy equals to a v. So when I do the matrix A times by xy, I get 3 over 5x plus 1 over 5y, um, 1 over 5x plus 2 over 5y. And then um, doing txy into component, I get 3x plus y over 5 and x plus 2y over 5. Right, that's a transformation. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice. So that's a Tanya, the last one. So I guess everyone has everyone has presented already. So we're gonna quickly cover um, section three and section four. So section three is talking about some applications. So one application is use it, use the double integral, triple integral to find the averages. So the average value, we use F like this bracket AV. Is this, well, this is a single variable calculus, right? So this is two dimension stuff minus uh, divided by one dimension, so left with one dimension. But now we have a double integral. Well, double integral, and uh, this is the integral of so three dimensions. So this is a three dimension volume divided by two dimension. So this is a two dimension, right? Because the integral is just one. So this is the area. This is the volume. So volume divided by area, that's just one number, average. Triple integral, right? Triple integral with integral four dimension volume divided by three dimension volume with left with one dimension, a number. So, so on and so forth. This can be extended to n dimensions. Let's see this example. We want to find the average value of such function on the region D, right? Rectangular region. Just follow the formula. Right? Just follow this formula. And this one with the integrand. The numerator with the integrand. The denominator is just area of the region D. Just the area of region D. And you could set up like this for a complicated region. But for this example, what is the area of D? This is pi squared, right? Because one dimension is pi. Another dimension is pi, pi times pi, this is square, pi times pi, pi squared. So we set up this, the integral is this one, x direction goes from zero to pi, y direction goes from zero to pi. How do we, how do we integrate sine square, cosine square, double angle formula? As one of the presentation earlier showed us, right, that's, so if we have cosine of x, y here, yes, we could use uh, integration by power, by power, but here we don't have cosine of x, y. So what do we do? We convert into double, we use uh, half angle formula or double angle formula. Then right, we do inside out. So in the end, we get this. So this is double integral with the integrand. Then we divide this by the area of D. Area of D is just pi squared. So we divide everything by pi squared. In the end, you get such irrational number. And the approximation is this. Let's see this example. So W, a cube is given. So this is a cube is proportional to the square of the distance from the origin. So the question, what is the average temperature? 
then B, at which points of the cube is the temperature equal to average temperature? Well, let's see. Right, so we have for temperature, so let's see. So C, let, B, let C be the constant of proportionality. So transformation is T of X, Y, Z equals to this proportional scalar of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And the average temperature then is following the formula, right? Is this transformation as integral, triple integral, divided by the volume of w. Well, what's the volume of w? Right, from negative one to one is two. So two times two times two, that's eight. So divided by eight is the same as multiplying by one eighth. So that's the average. So the rest is just calculation. The rest is just calculation. Yeah. Okay. Then B, the temperature equal to the average of all points satisfying such, which is the unit sphere. Okay. Unit sphere. All right, so this is one of the application to find the average value. Center of mass physics, right, also use. So the formula is, so we want to find the center of mass. So center of balance. So you can see this one, right, see this figure. The center, of, so the, the center of this, so which holds the pencil can hold this one piece. So that's a center. There's a center. If we do it, if we point to the right, they can hold the top piece. It won't won't tilt. You know, won't fall down. So this point is called the center of mass. So the calculation is this: we use x bar, y bar to represent the center. So x bar calculation, as you can see, so this delta means density function. Right, so this is a density function multiplied by x, then divided by this. Right. Similarly, x bar in higher, in double integral, in triple integral, x bar is a similar way, similar way to calculate. So for x bar, it's, we put x in the integrand with the density function as integrand. For y bar, we put a y in the integral with the density function. And for x bar, we divide it by, for both of them, we divide it by the integration of density function over the region D. Right. So the difference between the numerator and denominator is the numerator has the integral, x as integral. For y bar, same thing. The numerator has a y in the integral. Okay, let's see an example. So the density function is e to the x plus y, and the region D is 0, 1, 0, 1, which is a square. So we just calculate, we set up the double integral, x direction goes from 0 to 1, y direction goes from 0 to 1. We can evaluate in any order we want. And in the end, we've got e squared minus find x bar, so we multiply. Yes, any questions? For x bar, we put x in the integrand. Well, then the, the integration will be a little bit different. But after we integrate, we get an e minus 1. So x bar equals to e minus 1 divided by e minus 1 squared, which is 1 over e minus 1. Because it's application, we want to get we want to do the uh, approximations. So it's about 0.5 a2. For y bar would be the same thing, right? We'll put a y inside the integrand. Then we would also get a e minus one. Then we divide it by e minus one squared. So x bar and the y bar are the same. Okay. X bar and the y bar have the same value. For triple integral, same thing, right? 
for x bar, find it, find the x bar, we put an x in the integral for the numerator. For y bar, we put a y in the integral. For z bar, we put a z in the integral in the numerator. Let's see an example. The density function is given as such. Then over the cube, one to two, one to two, one to two, right? What is the mass of this cube or the volume of this cube, which is one times one times one, which is one. So we set up the triple integration, right? Evaluate, uh, triple integrate the integrand, the density function, right? So what do we get? We get a 15, we get a 15 over four e squared minus e. Right. Because, because the mass of this cube is one, so, so the mass of the bags is by formula six. Oh, hold on. Right, because we need to, because the mass is the inter integration of the density function. Right, it's different from before. It's not the, only the volume of W. So this is the dividing by mass. Is dividing by integrate the density function. So the mass is such 15 over 4 e squared minus e. Then because then we, we just you know similar way to find the x bar. So in this case x bar equals zero. Well you can check this. All right, you can check this. Then y bar then z bar. I see this one. Find the center of mass of the hemispherical region W defined by the inequalities. So the unit sphere, every point in the unit sphere. All right, just applying the formula. The, this one is a little bit complicated. Moment of inertia, right? You see this when we stand up like this, look at these pictures. So it's similar to center of mass, right? We can hold our body. So hold our body. So that's a center. That's a center. What we call okay, the delta is called a moment of inertia. And this uses different language. So moment of inertia about the coordinate axis. So at X, right, X direction. Is a such y direction is a such z direction is a such this is a computer moment of inertia at z for z direction for the solid above the x y plane bounded by z equals x squared plus y squared and the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals a squared. Assuming A and the mass density to be constant. So we just follow the formula, right? Set up the integration, lower limits, upper limits, put inside the function as an integral. And then we evaluate. So we get a such, such a, a representation. Gravitational fields of solid objects. You may look at this yourself. I'm not going to talk about this. Mm. So this is a 6.3. Now let's quickly go over improper integrals, 6.4. Very similar to single variable calculus. In single variable calculus, we see this is zero is not in the domain of the integrand, right? Zero is not in the domain of the integrand. So what do we do? We use this idea. We use the idea of limit. We use a dummy variable a. We said, okay, I'm going to change this integration, the lower limit to be a. Then I use the idea of limit. I let a approach to zero, right? Then I calculate. So in the end, for such, I get two. Um, and also for this one, 
right, the infinity sign is involved. Okay, so from one to infinity. So what do we do? We use a similar idea. We use a dummy variable B, then we use a limit idea, let B approach the infinity. Then we do the calculation, right? So for double integral, triple integral, same idea. We just deal with one by one, right? Let's see, if zero comma zero is not in the domain of such integrand, what do we do? We use a dummy variable, right? Uh, delta and uh, mu. Then we let those two approach to zero, zero. So exactly the same idea. You see for this example, the region D starts from, X direction starts from zero to one, Y direction starts from zero to one. Then zero comma zero is not in the domain of this integrand, so that causes trouble. So what do we do? We use the idea of limit. Okay. So we use these two variables, we call dummy variables. We say, okay, this is a pos positive numbers, so we get rid of zero. But then in the end, we take a limit. We we'll let those two variables approach to zero zero. So, you know, mathematicians are very smart. They, they figure out ways to get around problems. Right. Similar idea. Exactly similar idea. Right. This means, so sometimes if the integrand, right, with, how do we, Calculate the double integrand, the double integration. Right? We do this. We split with letter one because we have to calculate one by one, right? Like a partial integration. So we just split into this. The rest are the, you know, the rest are the same as before. Let's see this example. So the function f is defined as one over square root of one minus x squared minus y squared. We see x and the y, you know, cannot be one, right? So x squared plus y squared cannot equal to one. If it equals to one, it causes trouble. Um, so for x from negative one to one, no problem. For y, so this is only for x, right? It's only for x. So the y depends on x, right? So set up a limit, we see, okay, let a delta goes to zero. Then we do these calculations. Well, these calculations um, is a difficult, it's x sign, da 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 but just as an example, okay. So in the end, we'll get a pi. And similarly for y, if we do the calculation for y, we also get the similar answer. Right. So basically the idea is just use a limit, use a limit. Okay, this one is saying one over x minus y, d is the region, x goes from zero to one, y goes from zero to x, that's a triangle. Show f is not integrable over this such d. So that's the region d. Okay, we don't care for our class, we don't care about the integrability. All right, that's very mathematical. We can skip this example. And I think that's all I want to talk about. Yeah, that's it. That's it for the for chapter six. We're not going to chapter seven. Uh, we'll finish by chapter six. Okay, questions. Dayeli, Dayeli has questions.
no, no. Uh, um, I accidentally raised my hand. I, I oh, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, any questions? Um, I have a question about my homework grade. <clears throat> okay. So, I don't know if, I don't understand why I got an 80 on it. Can you explain? I'm so sorry, what is it? Uh, can you explain why I lost points on my homework? Oh, did you submit late? No. You didn't submit late? No. Nope. Which homework? Homework number two. Homework number two? Yeah. Oh, uh, so you lost your points probably if you didn't submit enough questions or submit late. But most people get, didn't get full credits because submitted late. Did you do enough questions? Yeah, I did. Enough? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Let me check. So homework two, right? Yeah, I think I, I'm assuming that. So for like 2.5. Okay, so I skipped 2.6, right? That was like one of the homework side. No, you, you can skip. No problem. Yeah, yeah, I skipped it. I don't know if you saw 2.5 though, because it's like in the middle of the page. If you want to recheck that. I'm okay, assuming I'll that you didn't that. see. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Also, Professor, I have something. Uh, yeah, I have the same issue. I got an 80 for um, homework number two. And um, I right. didn't, I, I, um, you said enough problems. We're supposed to do at least two, uh, two complete homeworks. We have to do 25 problems, right? That's right. Yeah, so I did 25 problems. So I don't know how I lost points too. I didn't submit the, I, I didn't submit it late either. I'll check for you too. So okay. homework two, go out. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Let me see the chat. Uh, resubmit homework six, Daily Y. You didn't get full credits? No, no, I did get full credit, but um, since you mentioned that um, 6.3 and 6.4 I um, are also homework that we need to do, I only included um, from 6.1 all the way to 6.2. Oh, I see. Not to worry about. Not to worry about. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Or oh, just a thing, same problem for homework two. Let me check. Uh, Gabriel, no, midterm, I haven't finished yet. Midterm, because I have to look at everyone's, then, then give grades all, you know, afterwards. I haven't, I haven't finished checking yet. Uh, Okay, Jun Yi, Jun Yi have the same problem for homework two. Oh, what's wrong with homework two? Everyone has problem. All right. Brianna, not yet, not yet. Uh, did I miss anyone, other people's questions? Okay, so Jun Yi, Ivy, Walter, Josephine, all have homework too, problem. Anybody else? All right. If you have no questions, you're free.